Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this episode of NHMC's Building Community. My name is Ricky Apples. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm a policy and advocacy fellow here at the National Hispanic Media Coalition. I'll be your host for today's panel on LGBTQIA plus inclusion. Pride Month may be over, but the ongoing fight for equity and our celebration of queerness never ends. And we're so excited to welcome Vico Ortiz, actor, producer, and activist from the hit HBO Max series, Our Flag Means Death, Frankie Rodriguez, actor and self-described future Real Housewife of Beverly Hills from High School Musical, the musical, the series on Disney Plus, and Curly Velasquez, actor, writer, fashion icon, and content creator from Pedal Like at BuzzFeed. Vico, Frankie, Curly, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having us. I love yeah, thank it. you so much. Yeah. So I'd love to just hop right in. Um, I use the term queer in my intro, and that term remains a controversial term in some communities, uh, but younger generations have really tried to reclaim it. And so I'm wondering what queerness means to each of you. And uh, let's start with Vico. Um, I love this because very much so when I first received the word queer in my life, it did not have a negative connotation at all. Um, so already imagine, at least like my side of the generation was like, yeah, the queer is a great word, but and I didn't even know it was a bad one until someone much older was like, same, like why queer, you know? Um, because in the past it was, it had all this like heavy baggage and now everyone is using it freely without shame or guilt and, um, and then I was like, let me look up, like, what does queer mean? You know, like, let me just, like, get the definition, right, and see what's up. And um, some of the words that, uh, that come up when uh, you just straight up just look for the definition of queer are uh, unusual, strange, curious, unconventional, atypical, different, right? And unfortunately, society, um, the, the society that we're currently living in, um, the way that we're brought up is to be scared of those of the of being those words it's bad to be different and we're constantly told what we can or cannot do to better serve the system that's currently put in place and instead of nurturing a sense of curiosity of the self and the world and the people around us um what we're told is being different is bad you have to fit in and these are the things that you gotta do in order to fit in so i don't want that <laughs> i don't want that for myself i don't want that for anybody and i love being queer queer is 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 healing uh, is healing all of that. For me, being queer nurtures that sense of, of curiosity and and exploration and, and learning and discover uh, discovery of myself and, and the world and the people around me. And it gives me this lens that's not set in, in restrictive or stagnant structures. Um, so, I mean, everything that I will do forever in my life, what I am, everything about me is going to be queer. It is, it has to be queer because um, it, it gives me permission to question and reclaim what works and leave what doesn't with love and compassion um, so I can keep showing up as a more uh, authentic version of myself every single day. So queer all the way. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so beautifully put. Uh, thank you. I, I really love that you talked about the systems that we exist within and how we've been taught to view it as something negative. Uh, I also didn't grow up with viewing the term negatively. Uh, and so, Frankie, what was your experience with the term and what, what is your experience with it now? Yeah, I mean, growing up, it, uh, being called queer was something that was definitely thrown out there and it wasn't in the most positive light. It was kind of to diminish and uh, made to feel bad. And so when the conversation was coming up and I, it kind of feels like it semi-recently of kind of using queer as a term to like blanket a big, a large community. I was like, oh, I don't know if that one sits comfortably with me. But then to see the way some people have really reclaimed it and kind of have stepped into it and kind of it's like almost as like a sense of power now. Um, and to say it with pride, like I'm a queer person. Um, now I'm like, I, it's weird to think there was a time where I wasn't referring to myself as a queer person. So um, I think it it's kind of exciting to see the way we can evolve in that way. And um, everybody's kind of just taking ownership in their queerness. And so um, that's kind of where I'm at with it right now. <laughs> I, I love that. I Thank you for sharing. That's so cool to hear 
uh, how you've evolved uh, with the term and to see others in your life evolve with it as well. Uh, Curly, what has your experience been with it? Um, mine was kind of weird. I had never heard of the word until I was like 13 years old. And my, my teacher who was a nun actually was like, he's kind of queer, right? And we were all like, what? Wait a minute. And then <laughs> we like, went to go look up the word and we were like oh shit that's oh am I allowed to cuss on this thing <laughs> we were like oh my god that's so uh oh my glob that's a <laughs> weird term and, da, da, da. and then you know I learned to not like it so much but as an adult and the way that I'm seeing people use it now I think it's really dope because the way that I see it is it's a way to find even more of our own indig individuality within kind of like the umbrella of our community so for me it's like it allows us to say we don't all live in the same box or just one box. It allows us to be a little bit more unique in all these different ways, like whether it comes into like what I'm into sexually or how I identify like in my gender identity can also be queer. I like it now because it's kind of like this way of being like, um, I'm like the miscellaneous drawer in the kitchen. I'm a little bit of everything thrown in. Like I'm not just like one thing. And so it kind of allows me to like, give a little bit more detail about who we can be. And to me, when we talk to the, to the straights, right, to the, to the cishets, we can be like, we're actually all very unique in our own way and we're not all the same. So like, come and ask me, like, come and see what's up. And you know what's also really cool about that is that not only are we not all the same, but y'all are not all the same, cishets. Mm -hmm. Like, y'all can get into some stuff too, you know? <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. I love that so much, um, especially your point about individuality, because uh, I hear that said a lot, too, about the Latina community, you know, like, we're not all the same. There's Cubans, there's Mexicans, there's Puerto Ricans, like, we can't all be pegged as one thing. And I think it's the same for the queer community. So thank you for each speaking to that. Um, you know, we often hear a lot about days of visibility, you know, trans day of visibility, non-binary day of visibility, and uh, sometimes even weeks. And that's obviously really important and necessary, but there's also a lot of conversations going on about the need to move past visibility towards consistent, equitable inclusion. Um, so I'm wondering why is it important to center queerness in our storytelling and how can we achieve that more often? We wouldn't be, talking about needing inclusion if there wasn't any visibility and we wouldn't be needing visibility if there was inclusion <laughs> so i feel like we need both and and i think i will always need both because as we continue to learn and evolve and grow as people um there will always be something new that will look to be visible and i hope that we um continue to keep our minds and our hearts open and and uh and give these uh spaces of inclusion right um and to and to answer why it's important um because it's a reminder that queer stories are human stories and most of hollywood still thinks that queerness is something that we're playing like i'm playing non-binary versus i am non-binary so when you center queerness and when you have accurate representation <clears throat> both in front and behind the camera um you get these nuanced stories of human beings who just happen to be queer so really when you center queerness you are humanizing the story and it's baffling to me sometimes to be like how did we even get dehumanized but it's like but it, it is important because it gives us this like nuanced storylines just that just happen to be queer but they're human um and that creates empathy and compassion and and opens conversations that connect us as human beings and uh hopefully invite for more inclusion in these political societal spaces um that's where I'm at with that. It's all, it's mm. all together, tied together. <laughs> yeah, no, I love your point about needing both. Um, one cannot exist without the other. They don't have to be mutually exclusive, uh, especially to understand that we're human and this isn't like a niche that we're playing to. This is the human experience. Uh, Frankie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I think it for me it just is all about understanding and when you're hearing all of these other stories being told in a real authentic way i think that does 
open a door for people to understand these different types of communities better. Um, and I think that's kind of where we're lacking at the moment, but it's really hard when, you know, <laughs> the people in charge don't really want to center those stories or there's fear about how it's going to be received. And so I think just trying to do your best to kind of be that center part of that story. Um, it's, it's still trucking along. <laughs> Um, I I want to echo what um, the other panelists are saying as well. Sidebar, if you see me like typing, it's literally because I'm taking notes. I always like, my brain is always like, mm. and then I'm like, Take, write it down before it leaves you. Um, so I was writing that like one of the things that we used to do when we were creating online content is we would call it inclusion without commentary. And so we would just include people without having to be like, this is, this is a gay story. It was like, this is about a person who's going to the market to buy a bagel. Like, and they just so happen to be gay, right? So we kind of would do like the Trojan horse of storytelling that like, oh, well, I love bagels. I'm going to watch this about, about this bagel because, it, and then the character just happens to be queer. And then it's like exactly the whole thing of like, can we just tell stories about being ourselves? Like we, when we talk to our friends, we're not like, the queer friend, we're not the gay friend, we're not the, we're literally calling our friends and talking about regular things like love, boys, like a bad meal that we had, like anything like that. And then, but on the flip, like as far as like, why is it important? Um, my dad actually, um, Marine, like came over undocumented from El Salvador, like mega machismo man back in the day who has like now like the ultimate ally like he's so dope he's like what are the terms like what am i he asked me the other day he's like am, am i a they them i'm like you can be i don't know what are you you what are your what are you thinking um and he uh like he was like why is it so important for for people to constantly be talking about like sexuality and gender and for me i'm like it's really important because of the whole like for example, like jobs, right? Like as a kid, I always thought that gay people could only do hair, makeup, or fashion. Like that's all. I was like, I guess I have to learn. I'm terrible at makeup. I'm terrible <laughs> at hair. But I'm like, I'm mediocre at making clothes. So I guess I can make clothes. So I got into fashion. I didn't know that like queer people could be like lawyers, doctors, poets, like all these different things. But had I had that sort of, um, you know, a uh, vision or something to look up to as a young kid, like maybe i mean i'm happy that i had like the life that i did but i'm also like what else could have been the possibility i always say that the only things that i had to look up to back in the day were people that i saw on ricky lake right or jenny jones or mm -hmm. and it was it's great those people are fantastic but they were almost like heightened versions right like they had to bring the drama so i'm in the fourth grade thinking that i have to bring the drama <laughs> and it's like it wasn't that it wasn't that serious um, so I think that like being able to see ourselves in ways that are humanizing um, and just existing is so important because it does a lot. It really does more than people think. Mm. Yes. Uh, also, no shade to Ricky Lake, by the way. I, I like <laughs> Ricky Lake, um, uh, chef's kiss of entertainment in the 90s. <laughs> no, that's so fascinating. And I love that story about your dad and, you know, brought up this this conversation too about like the the words that we choose to use um, and how language is evolving and so it's okay to choose uh, you know a new set of pronouns when you feel empowered in who you are it's okay to uh, choose a different word that represents how you view yourself in your community like Latina or Latinx um, and so I kind of wanted to actually ask you each about that like how do you feel about uh, the language that we're starting to uh, adopt in the queer community and um, do you feel empowered by it or do you do you see people in your life who feel more empowered by that language? I think language is super I, I mean I'm obsessed also with the whole like Spanish English because I grew up speaking Spanish predominantly and uh, well it was my first language for the, for the first 18 years of my life and uh, and the Spanish language is incredibly binary and not just incredibly binary, but centers the uh, cishet male experience as the only one and everything else is othered or barely even mentioned. So even feminizing words was a big issue, I think, in the 50s. Um, so now that Spanish language is also uh, reclaiming a neutral uh, term as well, um, it's been really interesting for me to have conversations about language and gender and binaries with people that are older because the way that we the, the way that we 
the, the language that we use affects the way that we see ourselves and relate to ourselves and the people around us and the world. Um, so when you see when your language ingrained in your in every single molecule of your being is so binary, introducing the possibility of there's more than two is like <laughs> every structure is like, but what do you mean? What? There's no way. Um, and and putting the language aside, the binaries aside, even stuff like I think if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, uh, in Greece, the way that they speak is very much in the present tense. So whenever they talk about the future, it's still very much like in the moment and here. Whereas in English, a lot of it, a lot of our language is like in, in in past, future, all these things. And that affects also how we relate to time and how stressed we are about time or not stressed about time. So in, so it's interesting how language does affect the way. And for ASL uh, folks, uh, deaf folks, um, uh, language is very conceptual. So also the way that you see the world world based on the language that you've grew up with um, affects the way that you see yourself and the people around you. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by it. And I think it's really a fantastic tool to get to know ourselves better. Um, I also think that as everything, language is ever evolving. So thinking that this is the language that we're going to use forever is like, we, we didn't talk the same 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 50, 100, we're not going to talk the same, you know, in another five years, 10 years, and that should, language is alive, and it should be alive, because we are alive, um, I think, in this dimension, at least, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, no, I love language, I think it's so fascinating, and um, I, I do think it's empowering, and, and it continues mm. to give us more, um, it just it just allows us to keep growing and in terms of like latina and all that stuff like i feel like for that word and latinx and latino latina um i think that there is like a collective um <clears throat> agreement that it needs to be inclusive um but i still think that the word uh regardless of whether it's latino latina latina latinx um people normally associate it with spanish speaking um and uh there's more to being you know latina than spanish speaking there's brazilians who would speak portuguese people from haiti who, who speak um creole and uh, you know and they are Latina, but people don't associate Latina with them. So I, I feel like that word might eventually dissolve, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, and we'll just straight up be like, I'm Puerto Rican. And, you know, we'll, we'll just say where we're from and, and acknowledge that. And um, but who knows? Yeah. You know, I think one big lesson I've learned in the last few years is that it it is always constantly evolving and I'm happy to be a part of a time where we're not so, cause like, I feel like I, I'm sure all of us feel the same way where like we're brought in, like what we're taught in school, like that's it. So it's either this or that. And there's, you're not really taught to kind of have a conversation about like, well, what's in the middle? Well, what does it mean to be over here or over here? And so I'm honestly thankful for things like this and also like, you know, apps like TikTok where people are sharing their experiences and kind of sharing where they're at and where they are, whether it's like pronouns or how they want to be referred to. And it kind of like makes me like question myself and not in like a negative way, but in a more like exciting way to explore the different parts of myself where I'm just like, mm -hmm. oh, like I can also be a little bit of this and this and this, and I don't have to like put a label on it or a name on it for someone else to understand me. Cause at the end of the day, I'm just trying to understand myself so I can be a better person for the world. So um, I think I, I'm very open to like seeing the way things change and evolve and kind of seen the way that's going to dictate the way my life goes and how I refer to myself or new things that I learned about myself. So I'm open to it. <laughs> I love that so much. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, I had a very similar experience just last year. And I think I'm still like learning and trying to figure out what parts of myself um, I want to embrace more. And so yeah, I, it's exciting. I feel like I'm at an age now where it's like not so scary to be like, oh my God, but what if someone thinks this about me? Or like, mm -hmm. I'm just like, I don't like, I could, I don't care what you think about me. It's like about me and my experience. And I'm like very open to the changes. Um, I don't know. It's exciting. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, Curly, did you want to add anything more? 
Yeah, I mean, you when you said you want to add anything more, are you giving me the option? Like, am I like, I'm good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can say I'm good. That's okay. I know oh, you're taking notes over there. <laughs> I am taking notes. I always get so excited. I'm like, oh my God. No, but I just wanted to echo like a lot of like uh, what Vika was saying too. Like when people argue about the word like Latine, Latinex, Latino, I'm always like, oh my God, we're arguing about the wrong thing. Like those words are all rooted in like white supremacy. And are, when are we going to talk about that? You know, when are we going to acknowledge like <clears throat> the indigenous communities that are, you know, a part of us, the black communities that are a part of us, like those words, you're right. There, it is an erasure of a lot of those identities. And it's like, we're over here arguing about one letter when we should be arguing about like, how do we make people feel seen in the community? Um, and saying that too, you know, Vika was mentioning how language is constantly changing. And I was thinking, I don't know if Vika, if you said this or if I just thought about it, but I was thinking about how people used to talk during like uh Shakespeare's time like oh where are thou blah 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 and I'm like and then you said what are we going to talk about in a hundred years I'm like what are we going to be talking like in a hundred years you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. but also too I do want to say that too like um and saying that language is is kind of like it belongs to nobody but at the same time you know my Angelo my favorite Aries perhaps to have ever existed maybe uh her and Lady Gaga um, but like she would quote the Bible often, she would say that words are so important. Like in Genesis, it says that in the beginning there was the word and the word was God and the word was with God, right? And so words are so powerful. They can change lives. They can, you can start wars with tongue, with your tongue is another quote. Um, and so like being able to use language so that people can feel safe and seen is really so important. And so it's like, stop being so precious about something that you're going to die anyways. You're not going to use it anyways. Like who cares? Like it doesn't matter but you know going back to what we were talking about those nasa photos those things of space and all the different things like how we're this mm-hmm. tiny little speck like if mm-hmm. in the time that we're here and and we can make each other feel safe and seen just by a simple word and a simple letter like why would we not do it like who what why are you so precious about it and so i'm mm-hmm. like everybody take a shot have a cigarette go do whatever <laughs> do whatever makes you happy um calm down it's gonna be yeah. okay and let's talk about like the real issues within the community that's what i always say yes uh no i you know you make so many good points and it actually leads into this next question i have because when we're talking about all these things that are going on and like you know chill out like find find joy in your life all those different things i think it can be really hard for younger people who are still navigating their sexuality or gender identity um trying to figure out what their place is in the world um to accept themselves it can be really hard for them right now when policies are being passed to take away their rights um you know they might just be becoming aware of what's happening in the world and feel afraid and so um vico in a recent panel, you spoke about uh, what it means to be non-binary, and you spoke about it a little bit today, uh, especially as it relates to Jim on Our Flag Means Death. And uh, I love what you said that Jim isn't more masculine when they have a beard and more feminine when they don't. Um, they are the same person, and the only thing that changes is the way that people perceive them based on their expression. And I just thought that was really beautiful. And so uh, for all those young people who get to see you live in your truth, both on and off the screen, who, whose lives you're changing by doing that. Um, what would you say to them about uh, the barriers you've overcome and uh, how can they make change in their communities? Ooh, um, well, thank you. Um, the, biggest, the biggest barrier that I've still in different ways processing and overcoming uh was that mental um indoctrination that society so carefully crafted uh for me so that i'd be afraid of being myself um and uh because of that barrier i um when i first came out my very my very first coming out i was i was like should, should i even i really put a lot of thought of should i even be public about this because i've been taught my whole life that being gay meant i could lose work or i could not get work and um and it happened again when i came out as non-binary and at that time when the way that i overcame um that mental barrier was to be incredibly loud about it and and have this like drive to prove the industry wrong um and what's interesting is that 
now that I've proven the industry that I can get work um, as a trans, non-binary, gay as fuck Latine, a new type of, it's like all of the things gay, um, a, a new, a new type of barrier, um, but around the similar vein has like popped in that I've like noticed. And it's that now the industry um, expects me to uh, educate and advocate for myself in all my workspaces. Um, and although I do love educating and I do love holding space for growth in conversations that are that go both ways, um, I am finding myself um, reminding myself that if one day I don't have the capacity to be super loud and like educate and hold all the space, especially in like predominantly cis head spaces uh, that I'm occupying, um, that doesn't make me less worthy of occupying these spaces, that I am enough and I am valid and that just being myself is plenty and I don't have to prove anything to anyone. Um, so now I'm balancing those boundaries. So mm -hmm. I would say to these young folks, like be yourself, um, yourself is enough, you are valid and you don't have to carry on these responsibilities of like having to educate every single person, you know, just being yourself, just being you is perfectly enough and surrounding yourself with community has been also like a major, major, major one for me. Uh, find find those spaces, those those friends, that chosen family, um, where you can just straight up just exist around each other and just just be able to see each other in that way. Um, so that whenever you do occupy spaces that are predominantly cishet, um, you have all that energy to be like, "What up? I'm queer. I'm here, and I'm gonna break some shit up," you know. Um, <laughs> so that's um, that's what I would say. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I can imagine if I had heard that when I was young and trying to figure it out, it would have meant everything. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Frankie, you know, you, well, we all know, you've also made history as the first openly gay character in the High School Musical franchise and also had Disney's first openly gay love song. Um, and for lovers of the High School Musical films, obviously Sharpay and Ryan were like queer icons, but <laughs> uh, how did it feel for you to openly embrace that representation on screen? And uh, what would you tell these young people? Uh, I mean, obviously it's crazy exciting that that stuff is actually happening and being done and that I get to be the face of it. It's kind of, a, it's a weird paradox world. <laughs> Sometimes I don't think it's real, but um, it's exciting. And, you know, to get those messages from, I, it's not just kids, it's like a wide range of people that have reached out and say, you know, like, whether it's an adult saying, if I would have had that as a kid, you know, I would have felt a little less alone, or I would have had more courage to come out earlier. Um, but then on the other spectrum of that, it's a lot of kids reaching out saying, I'm, I'm still closeted. I don't know how to do it. I, um, but your show gives me hope. And, and I think that's what we were talking about earlier, just kind of centering queerness um, and centering those storylines. I think it, it helps those people that aren't able because of where they are or what they're currently going through. It just really, I think helps people feel a little less alone. And, you know, one, kind of pressure I have felt is like, once you get a blue check on Instagram, you're like automatically an activist. And <laughs> people are like, I went to school for musical theater. I did not go to school for like, you know, like how to speak like an activist. And so I kind of like went through this whole thing where I'm like, how do I use my voice and what can I do to still put in my work, but also um, help people understand that I'm also still growing and evolving and you know I'm like I also need my space too to kind of figure my shit out so ooh, uh, my stuff out um, but and I think I kind of landed on this thing where I can be nothing but myself and that's I have to you know understand that it, that is a gift to myself but also if it can help someone feel a little less alone or to come out or um, to try something new. Um, I think that's exciting. So um, it's a tricky position to be in, I think, but I'm happy to be the face of something that I wasn't able to see as a kid. 
um, and hopefully give hope to somebody. <laughs> mm, you definitely are. I mean, you give hope to me, so know that. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that so much. Um, okay, Curly, last but not least, uh, you know, you've had such vast experience across media addressing intersectionality with Pero Like, working with queer icons in photography, mm. being an actor, being a fashion designer, um, and you've gained a lot of dedicated followers. So for aspiring queer artists and young people who are like, Curly does it all, I want to too. Um, what would you say to them? Um, I would, I wanted to say super fast to, to yeah. Frankie's point, what Frankie's point is making. Um, uh, somebody, I have this friend who is a black uh, celloist, I guess, would you say? Like they play the cello, um, amazing creative artist. And I was going through the same thing of like, how do I use my voice and what do I do? And he said something really cool to me. He was like um, a revolution, much like an orchestra in the revolution and much like an orchestra, everybody plays their own part. Like, mm -hmm. and we all kind of make this whole big thing. So whatever you're playing, whatever is like, if you're in the strings or you're in whatever, whatever the other instruments are like, we're all doing our thing. And so he was like, whatever you want to do, however you can do it, just do something, say something, you know? And I'm like, that's so dope. So that kind of helped me like not get insecure because I also didn't, go, I didn't go to college. I didn't do all those things. So sometimes people use big words and big ideas that I'm like, what the hell are you saying to me? I have no idea. Um, when I go to college, when I do college talks, I'm like, don't use your college words on me because I don't know what the fuck y'all are saying. And I still don't know if I'm about to cuss. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, but to answer your question, I'm like, look, being queer is hard. Everybody knows that we're all, I'm like, it's so hard. Like when you're growing up and you're with the streets, it's hard. You grow up and you meet other people just like you, it's hard. We're one of the most judgmental communities as well. We are, you know, people with a lot of trauma who sometimes let that out on other people within our own communities, right? So like, I would say what I would tell everybody, like pour into your own cup. What are you doing to become the best version of yourself? or your favorite version of yourself. Like, how do you look in the mirror and go like, oh, there you are. Like, how do you put on your earrings, your mustache, your, your, your makeup, your nail polish and go like, oh, sweet angel pie, I see you, there you are. And I think that pride, um, being able to express yourself is really a thing of privilege, right? Like I was born in Hollywood, in LA, like my experience was growing up with people who were the children of immigrants. So I didn't really even experience American culture until I was older. Like I was like, what do you mean y'all don't have piñatas and don't have like bolsas de regalitos at your parties and y'all don't dance at your parties? What do you mean? It was like a big culture shock for me. Um, but I think that my advice would always be like, it does get better. You can find community. You can um, find the places that you want to get into. Keep going. It is absolutely worth it. Um, you have uh, access to a wonderful tool. Hopefully you do. It's also a thing of privilege if you can access your phone the internet, TikTok, like there are people out there who are just like you waiting and excited to love on you, to hold you and celebrate you for everything that you are. So like, don't give up, keep going. That's what I would always say. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Uh, that's all the time we have, but I just want to thank each of you so, so much for joining us today and sharing your experiences. Uh, your work is saving lives, each of you. So Thank you. And for all of you watching, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch more episodes just like this. And don't forget to follow our guests and NHMC on all our social media platforms, including Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. For more information on our organization, please visit nhmc.org. And thank you so much. We'll see you next time. <laughs>